Um, but first, um, let me welcome up Melanie Courtright. Um, many of you know her, Executive Vice President, Global Products and Client Services for a little company called Research Now, joining us for the first time. Welcome, Melanie. And Melanie's going to share some, some results with us for, I don't, I don't know how many of you know or helped us out with this, but we have um, partnered um, with Green Book and AYTM for the first ever GRIT sample survey. Um, we've got all kinds of fun stuff focused just on sample, which Melanie's going to share. Um, after that, she's going to be joined by Mendy Ormland, not Disneyland, Ormland. Um, <laughs> he's opening up his own theme park soon, though, so stay tuned. Um, and on one screen, we're going to have um, Lenny Murphy, Editor-in-Chief of Green Book, and on the other, J.D. Deep, COO of AYTM. Um, SampleCon um, does not um, re be responsible for any technical glitches. <laughs> Melanie here promises she'll keep things going. Um, and then uh, we're going to open it up for questions. So please join us as we combine New Orleans, Atlanta, and Paris all here for the first time at SampleCon. Melanie. <laughs> Thank you. I, I want to start by saying what a room full of people, right? I mean, um, so if you know me, you know I'm super geeky about sampling. I just love it. I just love it. And, uh, and so to be allowed to give you my opinion and have you listen and give it any weight in a room full of my peeps is an honor. Like, uh, and the reception here has been so warm, so I thank you for that. Um, as, as mentioned, this is the first of its kind study, and I am super pleased to be able to show you some exciting results. There's going to be some surprises in there. Um, speaking with Patrick over the weekend and JD, um, and they'll be back on in a minute, and Lenny, um, there's some things that are going to challenge us and some things that are going to excite us um, and some things that are going to surprise us. So um, I'm excited to give it to you. By way of uh, background, the GRIT study, how many of you have seen the GRIT study? Most of you. So we're gonna we're gonna breeze through this part. Um, and if you want to spend some time with it, make sure to go to Green Book and uh, and find the full report. But what started this whole thing was this study said you know panel providers could use more love. Um, this is a little bit of an odd scale. So let me just my opinion is um, you could read this two ways. Um, but 35% said that they're very or completely satisfied with the sample provider. The, the middle point was not a true neutral, so it was moderately sample, uh, moderately satisfied. So I like to think that it's a little bit higher than that. But still, people tend to use a five-point scale, and they see a four and a five, and many of them gave it a three, gave it moderately satisfied. So they're not as happy as they would like to be. Um, and we know what people are looking for when they're going into research for sample. They're looking for quality, price, value, speed. They're looking for all those things. Um, when Chuck spoke, I was reminded, I'm always reminded of the weight of our responsibility. The things they are doing with the sample we are sending them. TV Guide is making decisions. Shopzilla is changing their brand. Fandango is going to market. They're doing these big, weighty, business, life-changing things with our sample, and the weight of that is, is a huge responsibility. So. Um, I'm inspired by that, and I'm inspired by the things that you're going to see here about the, uh, what we need to do next to, uh, to take that responsibility seriously. So um, the next thing that Grit showed us was that people still don't get mobile. Oh, people still don't get mobile. Um, so mobile's not now, mobile's yesterday, right? At this point, mobile really is yesterday, but research is still looking at mobile as tomorrow, and the surveys aren't keeping up. 70% um, of clients say that their surveys aren't mobile friendly, and only 55% of suppliers that we have to get there on mobile. So the next thing that the GRIT told us was that less, only about a third of suppliers are deploying surveys under 10 minutes, when everybody knows that what the respondents want is short surveys, but only a third of us are doing it. Um, so all these cool findings, seven most popular research technologies, and then they say they hear the, cha the challenge that we need to change. They know we need to change. 77% said, yes, I need to completely rethink my business model. I need to make myself change, but we're not getting it done. And so um, this also led to um, looking at the things that are driving satisfaction from the GRIT report. Um, quality, cost, and feasibility rule. They're the things that they're least satisfied with. If you look at the bottom two boxes, um, they're pretty good sized bottom two boxes on quality, price, and feasibility. So this made the, p the founders of GRIT and the founders of SampleCon get together and say, um, how can we work together to dive deeper into sampling? How can we spend more time? What, what can we do to, um, to better understand what it is we need to do? Let's focus just on sampling. 
as this conference does. So they issued a report, I mean, a, sorry, a survey. How many of you took the survey, at least started the survey? Wow, not a lot. I was, I'm surprised, that's less than half. Um, so the first thing they found is that survey taking samplers don't like to take surveys. Like we, <laughs> we, we genuinely hate it. We start it, we don't finish it. We, we, we take it and we probably pick it apart. Now ah, that's a stupid question and uh, this isn't mobile friendly, I'm just gonna bail. And so we just, we didn't, we didn't do real well at finishing the survey. So um, one thing that we, we got out of this is we're gonna do this again and uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna leave it in the field longer. We're gonna harass you more. Uh, because we think it's important enough that we want to make sure we get really great data. Um, and so, uh, but we, there's going to be some, some things that we got out of this that are, that are really important. So we're, we're glad we, we, uh, we went forward with it. So we got a mix of buyers and sellers, um, 137 buyers, 127 sellers. And even within some of the sellers selling sample, there are people whose job is to buy sample. And so we got a good mix of buyers and of, of people who primarily are involved in providing the sample and people who are primarily involved in buying the sample. You can see people at your organization, um, if you're a seller, that actually their job is to buy and acquire and collapse and, and blend. And so a few people move, but a really good mix of roles. Um, and then, so one of the first questions we asked them was, you know, um, what types of things do you do, do you use, what types of techniques do you do and use to actually um, get the sample, get the people to, to take the surveys? Um, by far, double opt-in panel blending, panel building was the, was the first. Um, followed right behind that by um, double opt-in community building. I'm not sure I fully believe there's a difference between the two. I think that's a funny thing that our industry does, a community is different than a panel. Um, but so you can see it's, it's this double opt-in pushing people together into a forum to, um, to be a part of a research world. Um, and then, you know, um, uh, you've got the um, using blending and, and using publishers. And, and so these are the things, there's no surprises in this. This is what we're, we're doing in order to push the people together. Then we ask this, uh, both the buyers and the sellers, so what are you doing to fulfill demand? When you don't have enough from any one respondent, when you need to find the sample, when you're looking for a niche audience, what do you do in order to get the, to fulfill the demand? Sample blending, number one, we push research now together with SSI and with protege and with swag bucks and we push them all together like GPMI, we, we push them all together, we make it better, we, we get higher reach. Digital fingerprinting, um, we utilize marketplaces, um, we increase respondent engagement, we decrease the quota requirements. These are the things that we're doing in order to try to get the job done when sample is a constraint. So, um, and here's where it starts to get a little bit interesting. Um, everyone agrees that respondent quality is the most important thing. Everyone actually agrees that respondent quality is the most important thing. So you can see here, respondent is the biggest word. This is a word cloud off of the verbatims. Um, survey is there. I'm really glad to see the survey there because how can you have a great quality data set? It's not just about the respondent, it's about the survey instrument. It's about all of it. It all comes together to make something special and unique. Um, it starts to fall apart though when you look at the buyers and the sellers. Here's where some of your surprises are gonna be, so pay close attention. The buyers, uh, but the sellers are focusing on the process. I'm gonna use digital fingerprinting, I'm gonna use technology, I'm gonna look at the survey design, I'm going to look at, um, at the process, the, tech, the technology, I'm gonna make it easy, I'm gonna be transparent. Um, I'm, and so they're, they're focusing on the process to get them to quality. The buyers are focusing on the respondent. They wanna know who the respondent is. They wanna know where the respondent came from. They wanna know if that respondent is gonna give them quality answers. They're focusing on the respondent. They're not focusing on the process, although that's important. They're not focusing on, on the um, survey in instrument, although God help me, I wish they would. They're focusing on the respondent. Um, and so there's this, there's this separation that emerges with, in, in terms of what quality means to the buyers versus the sellers. We'll, we'll spend a, a bit of time on this one. You can see the sellers, they're saying transparency of source is, what is, the, is the top number one thing mentioned for um, what drives quality. Followed by accuracy, reliability, consistency. And again, they're looking at the data, they're not looking at the respondent, they're, they're just really focused on that process and the technology and the data set. Validation of respondents, engage respondents, panel management, recruitment of panelists, and pre-screening methods. The buyers say the validation of the respondents, most important. We don't talk about that a whole lot. Maybe we should. Um, engaged respondents, the second, still, still respondents. 
flagging and removing responses, still about those respondents. They're really just focused on the respondents. They have a lot of anxiety about the respondents. I have a lot of anxiety about the respondents, but they have a ton of anxiety about these people. They still, we've been doing this for how long now? I, I, I don't know, 20 years? They still don't believe these people are real. <laughs> I mean, they, they don't. They, they think, we're, I don't, they, they don't trust us still after all this time. And they're making million and billion dollar decisions with the data, but they still don't believe in us. They still don't believe in the respondents. Transparency of source comes after that and then panel management incentives and representative sample. Who even knows what that means, right? Who, what does representative sample mean in 2015, 2016? We have to figure that out. We have to answer that question. Um, so one thing I can tell you, I don't think it made it into the chart here. Um, I'm gonna back up just for a second. Representative sample to them, actually, if you read some of the verbatims in the report that's gonna come out in a couple weeks, it means probability sample. It means they want it to be probability. They want it to, to um, stand right up beside and measure up against probability sampling in the, good, in the good old days. That's what they want. How do we give it to them? How do we at least give them something that makes them confident and trustworthy when they're making billion dollar decisions? So here's a snapshot of some verbatims that came out. Some people saying quality is getting better. Some people saying quality is getting worse. The people saying quality is getting better using the same reasons for the people that are saying quality is getting worse. <laughs> technology, it's making it better. Oh my God, technology, it's making it worse. So um, when you get the report, read the whole thing, you'll, it'll, it'll make you smile. We also did a max diff exercise. Now I've been asked to remind you that there are only 174 responses on this and so we have to take it with a grain of salt. Um, but I will say, looking at the grit, looking at what I know of the industry, what you know of the industry, these findings seem really, really um, directionally sound. So I, I feel pretty confident presenting them to you. Um, so this was what are the quality drivers um, and, and what range is most important. Um, by far the one that came up was um, techniques used to ensure that people are who they say they are. Um, that's the thing that they care the most about. Um, number, the last one was actually DIY. Uh, <laughs> we're spending an awful lot of time on DIY, so <laughs> this is the lowest uh, max diff score. And so we just need to make sure that we're addressing, we need to use research ourselves to make sure we're addressing what the buyers want. And we can force change and we can push people to change and we can bring things out before they're ready for them. We need to do that because otherwise we become stagnant. But we can't do that in the absence of also working on the things they care about and giving them the things they want, which is around quality. So um, many are stuck in the pre-social local mobile era, thinking there's only a, about 26 people who are using micro surveys. There are only 42 people using mobile and app surveys. Um, so this is, this is samplers, this is sample buyers, this is sample sellers, and these people are still not really using some of the new, the new things, and we're still not hitting the mark on making the buyers feel confident about who the respondents are, so what are we doing? What are, what, what are we doing every day? What, what challenges are we solving? What technology are we uh, releasing that's actually meeting a latent need? And we're, we're, we're doing a lot of stuff, but is it the right stuff? I'm not so sure. Uh, new competitive threats in privacy legislation for the biggest threats. <laughs> we could talk about this for days. Um, permission-based, everything must be permission-based, um, but everybody's feeling it. So this is just a little validation for you that when you stand in the shower and you worry about those cookies, you're not alone. Maybe literally not alone, who knows. Um, big, da <laughs> big data analytics, uh, especially after a night on the town last night. Let's not tell any stories. Um, all right, so, so the majority of agree that providers need to be consultative and enforce quality. Now I want you to pay attention here because we're gonna do something cool. So the majority of people believe that providers need to be consultative and enforce quality measures, right? Everybody says, yeah, those providers, they need to hold the line on surveys. They need to tell people when it's too long. They need to tell people when it needs to improve. But watch what happens when we separate it on buyer-seller. Completely different responses. Absolutely, this is the money slide. If you focus on one slide, focus on this slide. If you've fallen asleep and I've bored you somehow, wake up just long enough to look at this slide. When, the, when you ask the buyers and the sellers, should the, should the sellers educate on questionnaire design? Sellers, yes, we should educate. Buyers, no, we need my survey loan, right? Um, restrict access to sample if surveys are not mobile friendly. Of course you should do that. Of course I should not send this member that I've been working for days to get to join my panel who comes all the time on, a, on either a phone or a, lap or a tablet. Of course I shouldn't send them to some crappy flash-based survey where they fall off a cliff. Of course I shouldn't do that. 
buyers. No, 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 I need my sample to be wrecked. I need you to send that person in and I can at least pretend that I'm wrecked, right? Charge more for sample if surveys are not mobile friendly. Well, yeah, it's harder to do that stuff. I gotta beg these respondents to get through the surveys. Buyers, no, 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 don't do that. But I want my sample rep. Um, not field surveys that are not device agnostic. Now, I do think we will field them, but I, you know, in my opinion, I'll, I won't send mobile people to them. So again, there's some disagreements. Enforce length of interview limi limitations. Um, the buyers are, or the sellers are saying, yes, I should absolutely enforce it. Look at the difference there. Like almost every buyer agrees that you should enforce length of interview limitations and most of the uh, sellers, uh, sorry, most of the buyers disagree. Uh, and then offer online sample of equal quality to probability sample. I don't even know what that means. And I'm a methodologist, like I grew up in phone. I know phone, I know research, I know sampling. I could preach for days on sampling. But um, so the buyers are like, yeah, 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 do that. Do, do that, and the seller's like, no, 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 I don't wanna do that, I don't actually know how to do that, so. Um, big, big differences. And these are the challenges that we have to, like in 2016, I hope we tackle one or two of these, I really do. I hope we, we take one of these and say, how do we come together? How do we bring our view into alignment with the buyer's views? Traditional panels, it says, are looking for love in all the wrong places. Um, I think this thing is, is rendering a little weird, but I hope you can see it. But, um, so there is, yeah, maybe you can't actually. So what, <laughs> what the chart is supposed to be saying is do you think that panels are dying? Do you think that, um, that panels are in trouble? Um, and so uh, in, in general, there is a sentiment that, that traditional double opt-in panels are, um, are, are at maybe beginning the, beginning, beginning the product long tail. They're starting to sort of struggle. I personally disagree with that. I think there's room for both. Um, the phone is still around, mail is still around, Focus groups are still around. I've been around long enough to know that things like traditional panels don't die, they just get buddies walking alongside them down the research path. So, um, but um, only a third think that quality will improve. Only a third of people who took this think that, that quality in online sample will improve. That makes me sad. Um, and then there are stark differences between buyers and sellers on this one. Is sample quality going to get better or worse? Um, the buyers are, are saying, you know, no. Uh, uh, so the buyers are saying it's gonna get worse and the sellers are saying it's gonna get better. So th there's another big difference. Why do we think it's gonna get better? Are we telling them why it's gonna get better? Are we telling them about things they don't actually even care about? Like, why is there this dichotomy between the buyers and the sellers? So much rich information to think about here. And then if you ask them, why do you think it's gonna get better? Why do you think it's gonna get worse? Quality is important, but appears, um, it appears a, a little bit elusive. The, there are differing views on what's most disruptive based on future perceptions. You can see here, this is what I was talking about, technology. It's getting better because of technology, but it's getting worse because of technology. It's, um, it's getting better because of price and competition and market driven, but it's getting worse because of price and competition and market driven. So uh, the engaged respondents, they're, they're getting worse, but oh, the engaged respondents, they're making it better. So, so these, the same things that are causing people to think it's getting better are causing them to think it's getting worse, and why is that? We don't have a single measure of what is quality right now, and so we, have, we probably have to circle up on that and figure out how to actually prove or disprove the quality fears. A snapshot again, some quality is getting better and quality is getting worse. When you have some time, spend it on some of these verbatim. They're rich with information. Um, hand chosen, I won't read them here. I hate it when people read to me, so I'm gonna skip real quick. Um, buyers and sellers also disagree on factors driving the future. So sellers are saying quality drives the future. Sellers are saying quality drives the future, but that's not what we're talking about and that's not what we're building against. And so this is a little bit weird. Sometimes I think we just say what we think we should say instead of actually saying what we think is the truth. And then buyers are saying it's representative sample. Like they really, really want us to figure this out. So we should at least figure out how to talk about it. A uh, snapshot of different views on drivers of the future. Again, quality is getting better. Um, and and I probably, I need glasses. Don't bring, Bob, you wanna bring me your glasses? Uh, so you could spend some time on this. Um, two visions of the future of quality and what is driving it. First, um, quality is getting better reach. Hard to target and global respondents. Um, mobile capability and apps. Quality, technology and automation. Representative sample, instant takes, usability and response rates. Quality is getting worse. Why do you think it's getting worse? Engagement of the respondents. Representative sample, quality, and so on. So you, I think you're catching the theme here. 
There are some firmer graphics in this, just to tell you who took the survey. Um, but th I think the key here is there's, there's two things. One is um, there's a lot of really well-intentioned, really smart, uh, there's family in this room for me. I've worked alongside many of you. Um, you've been my partner in my firm, outside of my firm. You've been my client, you've been my vendor, you've been my colleague in industry initiatives. A lot of really smart people in here, um, and we're all really well-intentioned, but there's pieces that we're not getting right, and this highlights that. There's pieces we're not thinking about. There's um, buyer questions that we're not answering completely. The other thing is technology um, is probably what what created this portion of the industry, and it can be a blessing and it can be a curse. It can be a blessing because um, we can measure and we can speed up and we can automate and we can make things rapid, but it can be a curse because we can get really lost in the functionality of the tech and not take our head up long enough to say, is the tech doing what the buyers want it to do, or are we just really lost in what's cool and shiny? So um, my challenge out of this is to, is to take a step back and say, um, you know, how do I do both? How do I do things that are cool and shiny and automated and innovative, but also figure out how to do quality and answer the hard questions that the buyers are asking? So that's what I have to talk about, and now we're going to the panel. Thank you, Melanie. That was great. Very interesting. Um, JD, Lenny, do you see us? Am I in the right place for this? Yeah. Gotcha. Okay, fantastic. So, just a couple things to comment on, and then we'll jump into the panel. If you want, I can join. It yeah. Looks a little empty. Yeah, I feel alone. Um, we should so have anyway, a monitor right here with heads. Yeah, we should put the screen right there. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. So as we, all know, heads. as we all know, preparing for a conference, um, just in general, it's a lot of work that goes into it. And one of the two things that really come into play that people always consider is, where are we doing it? What's the place, right? Where are we doing it? And what's the price? And the good news is that next year, you can be anywhere in the world, and it's free, just like Lenny and JD. So <laughs> for any of you that wanted to be in like uh, the Bahamas, go for it. We'll have a live hookup there. And, and on that note also, you know, you, there's so much talk in this industry about how we're a little bit behind on, uh, on technology. I don't know, this is the first conference I've been at where we got France in the house, we got Atlanta in the house, we got live hookups, so I'm not sure we're, we're that behind. Um, anyway, so kicking this off, I got good news and got bad news. Um, Bonnie, bad news or good news first? <laughs> okay, so let's do the bad news first. Um, the bad news is we only got 20 minutes or so for Q&A and um, I want to refer to it more than a Q&A for a discussion. I think that's what we're going to do here. We're going to have a discussion with, with Lenny, JD, Melanie, and also the audience. So, so that's the bad news. We only got like 20 minutes left. I'm taking up a lot of that time. Um, <laughs> the good news is that we have 20 minutes left. There's, that's good news <laughs> as well. And that's a great segue. You're all looking at me like I fell from the moon. Um, what on earth is this guy talking about? The good news and bad news. And that's kind of what I thought of when I was looking at the data and the results of the survey, and Melanie alluded to it right to left, left to right. Um, but that's exactly what I was thinking about in some of the data and some of the results um, when it comes to quality and what's driving, you know, what are some of the key factors. There are some that say technology is going to make it better, some that say it's going to make it worse. And I think the other thing, there was, there was one other one that stood out in the, in the presentation about um, not quality, but it was, I, I can't recall what it was, but let's, let's go with that, <laughs> if sample. we can go back to it, but <laughs> sample, yeah. what's going on? How could technology, how can technology be better and worse? And maybe we'll start with, with JD. Um, is technology making it better or making it worse? What's going on here? Uh, I think technology is driving uh, something that, that's causing great sort of consternation for both sample buyers and sample sellers. Um, the, the, our, our business is fundamentally founded on people participating in surveys. And technology is changing the way that they participate in ways that affect the economics of our business. And so when you think about the implications of that, it, it actually, it affects 
sample sellers and sample buyers a, a little bit differently, but it still fundamentally affects them. Um, when we think about what it means to try to produce an engaged respondent, uh, there's, there's a lot of things that uh, as an industry, if we're not doing now, then we're already sort of behind the curve in terms of engagement and kind of building loyalty and all the rest of that. But then to, to go put them into sort of a punishing environment uh, is you know, directly contradicts the, the types of things that we're doing to, to build engagement. You look at it from the buyer side, uh, there's a ton of business still, a ton of legacy business that's out there um, that hasn't changed. I, I mean, you know, the, the great data show it and, and it's, uh, you know, it's not supposition for us. I mean, people, we can see this in our daily lives. So I, I think it's a, just a, a way of seeing it, that both of us are, are affected by it. Um, and it, it's, it's causing us to, to ask some pretty basic questions about our, our business model. And so I, I think it, in that way, there's, there's plenty of exciting things that are happening with technology. And there's plenty of ways that uh, technology can make it easier for us to reach respondents, can increase the, uh, what we learn from them to make it easier for them to participate. But at the same time, I think that that, that threat with the economics is, is a real challenge. Thank you. Yeah, so I, I, I actually recall the other item, which, which, <laughs> which is even more interesting. This one's my favorite. I'm trying to figure this one out. Um, so maybe Lenny, you can help me out here. Um, price competition is making quality better and making it worse. And this is one I can't figure out how price, com I, what is it? Is it making it better? And ha if it does make it better in your eyes, Lenny, what, why, how does price competition make quality better? And if it's gonna make it worse, how so? Well, I don't know if, if it's price that makes it better or worse. I mean, competition inherently is a good thing. It makes people uh, try and take steps to see what someone else has. Um, in this scenario though, we have you know, these two other key stakeholder groups in our, in our industry, we have consumers and all the massive change happening in the consumer landscape uh, with how they utilize technology, with uh, kind of expectations on, uh, on engagement. Uh, there's even studies that show that our brains are changing as a result of how we, we uh, are so ubiquitously engaged with, with tech 24-7. Uh, um, so that's a big deal. And then we have on you know, the client side, which are also under lots of pressure, uh, and their budgets are shrinking, and they're they're expecting more, and they're seeing disruption happen in their businesses and in their internal organizations, and how they uh, they get data and use data. Uh, so it's natural that we're going to feel some pressure from all of those things to try and, and rise to the occasion to be more competitive. But it creates a lot of disconnect, you know, in a consumer population that expects to be entertained with cat videos 24-7. And I don't mean that in a disparaging way, I like cat videos too. The uh, you know, research doesn't do a good job of engaging. You know, we don't do a good job of marketing to the consumer the value of their interactions with research. And brands don't want to spend the same thing that they spend for marketing. I mean, if you look at programmatic, you know, uh, programmatic advertising, you know, that is far, a far more cost-effective solution for marketers than traditional marketing uh, techniques like TV and print, et cetera, et cetera. So where does research fit between these two pressure points of a rapidly changing consumer base uh, and a rapidly changing business environment, all focused on technology, on automation, on you know, doing things cheaper, faster, and maybe better, maybe not better, but, uh, but certainly happen to rise to the occasion to do something different than we've always done it. It's a tough spot. Look, I think it comes down to um, tech is uh, tech is uh, a, has a slightly different challenge in research. Um, tech is supposed to take things that we do with our fingers and automate them, right? But most of the stuff that we do with our fingers in research takes a brain, and so our challenge has to be to embed the intelligence of the researcher into the tech. And sometimes we get so busy just automating, we forget to embed the intelligence of the mind that was doing the sampling task into the technology that's going to do it for us. And so we have that, that's the challenge. So if, if you're just doing tech for tech's sake and you're not like really thinking about how do I make sure I'm not adding bias to the tech, then it's a curse. But if you are embedding the intelligent mind of the researcher into the technology, then it's a blessing. And, and that's the choice that we have to make every day when we're, when we're building our tech products. Yep. Yeah, I, think I think that's a great point, Bill. 
I, I think that's a great point. Now, I, I think that that is, you know, we, we talk about DIY, uh, and, and I, I don't actually think we've sort of seen the, the, full, the full breadth of that. I, I mean, the first step of it was automation, but, you know, dumb automation doesn't get us anywhere as, as an industry. I think that that whole idea of trying to build more intelligence into the processes. I mean, that, that first step of automation is going to be necessary for the economics, but that, that intelligence is really where I think it's going to go. I, I agree with you completely there. Okay, so moving now, on. How do we apply that same thinking? Oh, sorry, Mandy. I just wanted to follow up on that. that go ahead, I agree go with ahead. what Melanie you're saying as well, but the, um, you know, how does that apply to how we engage with respondents? And that's the critical issue. We're talking about sampling. It's all about how do we get people to take surveys, period. Whether it's a mobile survey, a desktop survey, a mail survey, whether it's five minutes, 10 minutes, or 30 minutes, you know, there, there is a value exchange that has to be in place. Uh, and I don't think we're doing a very good job of utilizing technology to create and reward uh, folks in that value exchange model. And that may be, if anything's going to bite us in the ass as an industry, it's going to be that. And it's, I don't think it's about privacy. I don't think it's about big data. I think it's about boredom. Uh, and if we can't get people to really actively engage and feel like they're getting value out of it, then no matter how smart we get with the mechanics of research itself, the data collection, it's not going to mean anything. All right, let's move on to the next question. Um, then maybe we open it up a little bit to the audience to share feedback. I think this is one that, um, you know, dear to my heart at least, and I think many others that I've had conversations with at the conference, and I think it's kind of the sample con way. It's a little direct or, or goes straight into the business model. Um, so quality, right? I think we all sit and we talk quality every single, you know, I, I'm not, I haven't been around for 20 years in this industry necessarily, right? So I'm sure this has been going on for 20 years, but ever yeah. since <laughs> um, I've been involved or I've participated, every conference, every discussion, sample quality. May it always be so. <laughs> <laughs> so here we go, thank you. Unapologetically. So, no, and here we go, okay? We're gonna dive right into this. And the good news is that everybody agrees, the buyers and the sellers all agree we need quality. So what's holding us back? So my question is, anybody that operates a panel, right? If you operate and you need to acquire, some people refer to it as panelists, I like to call them people. These are people that are coming to participate in a, in a survey. Um, look at the economics, right? You have to acquire a person. This is not somebody that, that's flow, you gotta acquire somebody that's gonna take interest in sharing their opinion, okay? That costs money. And the question is, how much money does it cost? Now, you gotta retain them, and we're talking about surveys that um, we saw Stop. that none, none, <laughs> of us, none of us got through, or many of us didn't even get through the GRIT survey, okay? And this is our industry. <laughs> we're familiar with the surveys, the survey design. All of us are, know it. For some reason, couldn't get through it. Um, you know, I, I actually enjoy sharing feedback towards when, after I fly, and you know, you get from Delta or JetBlue, I love, or you know, you lease a car and you get that email. I actually love to share my opinions, but honestly, halfway through, I'm out. I can't do it. There's a massive grid in there that just, on my mobile phone, is just horrible. So anyway, the bottom line is we want to acquire quality respondents, but there is a limitation in the price that you can pay to bring them in. So my question is to, you know, it's a general question. I know we want both, but for buyers, are we are we able and ready? to potentially pay a higher price or to sustain pricing, because there's a lot of people that feel prices are coming down, and the bottom line is, are we ready to pay a higher price to get a quality or potential quality respondent in the door that might you might have to find them on mobile, so you touch on representative, you have to find people where they are. Are we truly ready to tackle it? And I'm not saying that's the only way, but that plays into it. You have to pay a price to get a user and retain them. So. General question, maybe Melanie, if you want to maybe address that, and I'd love to hear opinions from the audience. Well, this has been the Research Now proposition for a long time, um, and we believe fully. We, we know that there's a great big set of buyers out there who 
um, want all three, they, um, they, the iron triangle of speed, quality, and price. Um, they want all three, and they're, they're not willing to pay less and, and end up with crappy data. And so our, our, um, pro our value proposition for a long time has been, you know, you're gonna pay a little bit more, but you're gonna get data that you can make TV guide decisions on and that you can make billion dollar marketing decisions on. And there's others in this room that, uh, that that's their proposition too. So I do think that um, if, you, if you set yourself apart in quality, that there's a, a very lo large, strong market that's, um, that's willing to, um, to pony up and be at the table with you in that area. There are also people who do good enough in search. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's, you just have to decide as a company who you're going to be. Um, and and um, if you if you want to lay your head on your pillow at night and think, I need a really great data set, that costs a little bit more. Um, and, and then you find the buyer's willing to pay it. That's my point of view. Okay. Anybody in the audience uh, want to share some their thoughts or questions for the panel or participate in the discussion? We've got someone in the back. Um, obviously, we talked about speed and price and quality as the kind of three things. Uh, speed's obvious, price is obvious. But what does uh, quality actually mean to you? And how do you go about justifying that to the client and proving quality? Because that's what everyone's worried about. How do you articulate what is good quality? Yeah, so I don't know. I'll, I'll also let uh, JD and, and Lenny speak to this. But for us, quality means that when people go through the screener that the incidences that you get match what you would get in the marketplace if you were to do it side by side with some other study. It sh it's, a, it's really about and is the data that's going to come out actually going to be predictive of the large market that I'm trying to, to study. Um, you, you can see little pieces of that. People say it's about straight lining in a grid. Okay, if they're not paying attention, that might be a piece of it. Um, it's about um, data traps. Okay, there might be a piece to that. It's about speeding. But it's not that for, uh, for me and for us, uh, for anybody in the room, I hope. It's really about um, is the data, and you can tell it in the screener right away. You can immediately tell if you've got good data or bad data. As people go through the screener, you either overqualify or, or you, know, you end up with 17% um, of people saying they own a segue. Not so. So um, it's, it's, about the, it's about the data, and is the data predictive of the market I'm trying to make a decision about? Lenny or JD, I would agree. It's about the data integrity. Go ahead. It's, uh, I think she's right. I mean, it's about the quality of the data um, uh, itself, uh, and that means the quality of the respondent. So are they honest? Are they engaged? Uh, is it representative of the, the population that it's supposed to be? You know, those are the hallmarks of quality that – from a, a research standpoint, sampling standpoint, we have to this. So I think uh, uh, the only thing I would add to that, which is, is, is that there are very different implementations of of how those how, how those things are kind of put into practice. I mean, ultimately, the the validation of a respondent uh, as a real human being, as a, as a single person and not multiple people on the same account. Uh, the, the validity of their, their answers. Uh, I, I've seen a lot of different implementations of it. Um, and I think that, uh, I mean, I think the, the, the observation that I can make without uh, not, not, not trying to be too uh, biased about it in a way, but I, I've seen it in traditional market research companies. I've seen it in newer companies as well. Um, and I, I do think there is something to be said about the circular nature of the relationship between respondent quality and instrument. And so to the extent that um, I, I still believe that sample companies have a role to play in all this. We have a choice to make about um, the types of things that we let our panelists be exposed to. And because that really changes, it can be a vicious circle where you create a spiral of respondent quality. Or it can be a virtuous circle where you actually get better participation. Yeah, so I think also in, you know, in the slides, you know, there was the disconnect between buyers and sellers on, I think the buyers were very focused on the respondent, the person, right? That was quality is focus on who that person is. And I think, you know, sellers, you didn't see it as much, but I, it, you know, I do think that sellers or panel providers, anybody that has a community, whatever term you'd like to use for it. Um, I do think from speaking to many, they are very focused on the person. And the trouble that they face is 
for the most part, in order to find that person, you need, they're coming in mostly from mobile these days, right? If we're, where's everybody getting connected? Is it, for the most part, how much time in your free time are you on your desktop? Are you on your mobile device? So I think for a lot, of the frustration for some sellers or folks that have people is they're saying, we have them, but we're on a different device. Is that an issue? And, and how could we, um, I don't know when, how, or how are we going to make that transition? Because many folks seeing that mobile, right, or people coming in from mobile gets you a little bit more of a representative, or that's where you reach them. They're ready to take it. But the design or the questionnaire, whatever it is, what was it, 70% were in? Any, any thoughts on, on that? When are we going to do it? It's going to be driven by clients, and it already is happening. So the, every major CPG company that I know, and I work with a lot of clients and, and lucky enough to work with, with three of the biggest CPG companies in the world at a very deep level, their bud budgets are already transitioning away from traditional trackers and traditional testing. So they're going to speak with their wallets, and the, you know, the, the, the traditional model of doing long, lengthy online-based surveys is simply going to go away. Because they get it. They get that they have to go where the consumers are. So they will make that change as painful as it is. And they already are making those changes. It's going to take two, three years for that to run all the way through the system. So by the time we hit 2020, the era of 30 minute long tracking studies will be dead. So this will become a non issue. So market forces will simply push everybody in that direction that's already happening. Running low so on we don't time. need to spend a lot of time worrying about it. We're running low on time. Let's move it over. Peter, I think you had a question. Thank you, Lenny. Yeah, they, I want to follow up on your question and Lenny's comments. People I talk to who are dealing with this stuff, the problem the clients have is the normative data that's in all these trackers and also normative measures that they've been formally you know, gathered over time, which I think is a big problem here. If anybody could comment on how you think we can deal with those normative data differences and get the clients over the hump. I agree with Lenny, but I think there's a real resistance to moving because of that reason. So we're, the, way we're, the way we're dealing with that, and, and I'd be interested to know if others have ideas too, because I really like the concept of this being a forum of, of, of thinking. Um, but the way we're dealing with that is um, we're actually um, helping clients do analysis to say what, what parts of the survey do they really need? Um, and then we help them you know, take questions out of the survey that are nice to have and not need to have. Um, using advanced analytics to, 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 to say which of the ones are the ones that we really need the most. And then we're running side by sides. We're also playing with splicing and, and, and automation of splicing technology um, that gives them the data without having to ask everything. Um, and then we're doing lots and lots of testing. So it is again that concept of taking, well, what would I do in my mind as a researcher and embedding that, that logic into the technology so that the technology can do some of it for them and they don't have to ask every question. Um, there, there are lots of good things out there. There's good case studies, and maybe we should talk about those at some point. But um, it's possible. It's just a change aversion. People don't like the change, and they get nervous, and it takes a while. It takes a while to do it well. All right. So it looks like we are out of time. Um, thank you very much, Lenny, JB. Regards from New Orleans. Thank you so much, Melanie. We appreciate you presenting. Thank you so much. Thanks for the participation. <coughs>